Many kinds. Yes. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Father, <coughs> we thank you for the gift of uh, Pentecost and uh, the Shavuot, the outpouring of the Spirit, which is continuously being outpoured. And as we go through our, our study on the Holy Spirit, the eleventh hour of the Holy Spirit, may we realize the times we are in the urgency to live a life in the Spirit, and may we enjoy these hours because the 21st century is the century of the Holy Spirit. And so may these men and women rise up to proclaim Jesus as the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. This morning as I was preaching, I discovered some more facts. The Holy Spirit does not come to convert your ears. He comes to open your mouth. Amen. 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 Now, a lot of you have been dead silent with your faith. You leave it up to me and Francine. You've got to open your mouth. You just don't decorate every Sunday. You've got to open your mouth. Amen. Amen. Right here, amen. You too, St. Joseph. Amen. Okay, now, in Matthew 20, if you remember just reviewing Matthew 20, you can see that all the, everybody see all the hours in there? Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 5. Do you see all the hours? The third, the sixth, the ninth, the eleventh. Do you see all the hours? Yeah. Now we're journeying through those hours, and we got still stuck on the third hour. So we're going to pick up right now on the third hour. I left off last week when we were going into Isaiah 28. Is a, le a, a lesson in tongues. Remember that Isaiah 11:28. And I took you to two passages in the Bible which are similar. Um, in Hebrew, they're totally untranslatable. So when you read it in English, Isaiah 28, 11, there is no translation. Okay? So if you want to put that in a little note for yourself in your Bible. So every translator of your particular version of the Bible um, should put a big note there. There's no, there's no translation. And so what it's supposed to be sounded like when you read it, ha sha al hazbaz, it sounds like tongues. So when you have the gift of tongues, you have a reversal of Isaiah 28, 11. Okay? Now, Pentecost, the third hour, is to do two things for us. To give you rest and refreshment. Did you write that last note in? And then it's supposed to give you power and restoration. So we need... Uh, the third hour is the power and restoration. But guess what? We're not at the third hour. We're at the 11th hour. So let's continue the journey. Now, I, I want to share with you two other passages about the third hour, and then we'll move into the sixth hour. The third hour, I, I, if you've got your swords, everybody got your swords? Mm -hmm. uh, if you go with me to Ezekiel 11. Who wrote Ezekiel? Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is the Old Testament. Do you like the Old Testament, man? Yes. Okay. She, uh, she says that God should have wrote everything in Hebrew all throughout. But God did listen to her, and uh, some of it's in Greek. Okay, so everybody find with me Ezekiel 11. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air, okay? Now, Ezekiel was a priest, and he was probably in those deportations. And I told you, if you put a little note there, I told you many times that Ezekiel started the synagogue. Does everybody know that? No. Okay. Now, every time you read in Ezekiel or you read in the Psalms, the elders gathered together. When you read this, anybody read the Psalms? Anybody hear their Psalms? Every time you come across a little phrase, the elders gathered together, that's, that's the synagogue. Are you getting this? You've got, you got, you got to get this. Amen? So let's go look, look at Ezekiel 11. This is judgment against the wicked counselors. The Spirit lifted me up. Now, when you're in the power of the Spirit, you always got to be lifted up, and that means you don't have any power. It's, um, I just saw a friend of mine uh, that she stayed with us in our community at St. Antoninus, and she got married, and I said, finally, and because she was a teacher in a local school around here, and now she showed me her two surprise packages. Mm -hmm. It's called Stereo. And uh, there, there's a boy and a girl, so 
they're, they're really beautiful to behold. So the Spirit lifts you up. Everybody underline that. When you're in the Spirit, uh, are you all in the Spirit? You can never feel you're burdened. Did you ever feel like you're burdened before? Did you ever look at your husband and felt like you were burdened before? Okay. Did you ever go to Manhattan and feel like you're burdened? Yes. When you're in the Spirit, you can't be burdened. Are you getting this? So you are what? Lifted up. John the Revelator in, in, uh, in the book of uh, Apocalypse says, I'm lifted up. And were you lifted up today, ma'am? Oh, yes. Okay, she was lifted up today. And brought me to the, to the east gate. Now, if you underline there, the east gate is the gate where uh, everything uh, is facing to the end of time. To, and the house of the Lord, which faces east. And behold, bum, 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 at the, at the door of the gate, there were 25 men, and I saw among them Jezaniah, the son of Azur, and Palatiah, the son of Benaiah, princesses of the people. Did I pronounce that right? And he said to me, Son of man, now, every time you see Son of man, that's Jesus um, being identified also because he's called the Son of man. And back in Ezekiel chapter 2 and Ezekiel chapter 3, he gets the title as a prophet, Son of Man. So when you hear the Lord Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you hear the title, Son of Man. It's the prophetic word going forth. Okay? See, the, the Bible is such an incredible book to study, isn't it? Yeah. How many think for your whole life you missed a lot of these details already? So if we're going to be in the third hour, we've got to know that we're lifted up. And here's what he says. Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity. And I say iniquity? Abon. And who give wicked counsel in the city, who says the time is not near to build houses. This city is the cauldron and we are the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them. And the spirit, number two, the spirit it, um, lifts you up. Number two, the spirit falls upon you. Now when the spirit falls upon you, it means you are being under the sovereign power of God. The Spirit falling upon you, and, and that's what Jesus said in, in the synagogue of Nazareth in Luke 4. The Spirit of God is upon me, which means uh, the Spirit of God is doing a, a mighty work in me. Thus says the Lord, so you think, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in the city. For thus says the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in the midst of it. These are the flesh in the city. So what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon us? We are now being divided against the what? The wickedness of the world. Now remember I told you many times that the word poor in the Bible, shafak in Hebrew, S-H-A-P-H-A-K, shafak. Remember I told you the word poor is always used in reference to the Holy Spirit. You can never have the Holy Spirit come to you in a drip. It's a poor. It's a Niagara Falls, right? So do you think if you're, if you're for three seconds Standing under Niagara Falls, do you think you'd be wet? How quick do you think you'd be wet? Now when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, there's an amazing thing that happens in Acts chapter 2. Ready? The Holy Spirit comes suddenly, but not only did the Holy Spirit come suddenly, everything happened. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't come in little dribs and drafts. How many like to have everyone go, wah? Wah. How many think you can hear him handle wah? Now, say you won the, the $5 million lottery, would you like it piecemeal or the whole thing? You know what I'd say? Whole thing, baby. Give me the whole thing. Now, when you have the Holy Spirit, the problem is, you might have got it in piecemeal. But in Acts chapter 2, on the third hour, the Holy Spirit comes in full package. Okay, you, you got that? It's a full package deal when you have the Holy Spirit. And it, it's right away. So we can see everything that the Holy Spirit's uh, doing. Look at verse 14. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, your brethren, and your brethren, your fellow exiles, from the whole house of Israel, all of them are those whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said. They have gone far from the Lord to this land is given for possession. Now when you have a, the power of the Holy Spirit, you have a direction of where you're going. You have land that you're going to take over. Now the Jewish people right now are, at this moment, do you know what's happening at this very second? Hello? Anybody know what's happening at this very second? The Jewish people are already starting to build the third temple. At this second. It's already begun. Amen? Amen. Thus says the Lord God, verse 16, Though I remove them from afar among the nations, Deuteronomy 7, 
I scattered them among the countries. This is called the what? The diaspora. Yeah, now, what happened on Pentecost? They all came together. So put a little note there. Draw an arrow to Acts chapter 2, the third hour. They all came together. That's called the what? The diaspora. Everybody see that? Okay, put a little note there. Um, yet I've been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they've gone. Now what's the sanctuary, everybody? The synagogue. What did they do in the synagogue? Basically, the synagogue that Ezekiel established, and this is the birth of the synagogue, what we're seeing, the birth of the synagogue is they would gather around the what? The Word of God. What did they do on Pentecost? Remember, Pentecost is not for the ears, it's for the mouth to be open. Yes? Are you getting this? So now, look, look what it says there, 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will gather you from the peoples, put in their Pentecost, and assemble you out of the countries which you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come here, they will remove from all its detestable things and abominations. So what's going to happen when this absolute happens, you're going to see a cleansing going on. So what do we, what do we call this? A cleansing and a refreshment. Look at verse 22. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings. Everybody know what the cherubim are? It's the first, second highest group of angels in the Bible. We have the seraphim, Isaiah 6. When he looks out and he says, Gadosh, Gadosh, Gadosh. Now the cherubim come in, and I believe the cherubim were around the very burial of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus got up and walked because he's the mercy seat. What's on the mercy seat are the cherubim. So the cherubim were at the front and the back. And they said to the women at the tomb, why do you look for the, for the dead among the living? He's not here, he's been raised. So if you circle the word cherubim there, the cherubim lifted up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the Lord was over them. So we, we can see here, now, the wings are adoration. Adoration. So they came in, they had to cover their face, they had to worship the Lord in the middle part and they also had to move in the spirit. So how many, how many would like to have a cherubim background of God? You can't look upon him because he's so pure. You got to worship him all the time and you got to move in the spirit at all times. Now when you keep moving, what happens to you as you keep moving? You're free. So that's the third hour. The third hour is all this is, is supposed to happen. Look what he says there. Verse 23, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. What city are we talking about? Jerusalem. And stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit, see, lifted up all the time, lifted me up and brought me into the vision of the Spirit into the Chaldea, to the exiles. So what is Ezekiel doing? I'm getting a vision. What happened at the third hour? God let loose with, with people having visions. Now I told you many times, we haven't had a good, decent Pentecost yet. Because I told you what's going to have to happen. Your kids have got to see. Say you have a granddaughter called Christina. She's got to wake up tomorrow and say, Grammy? Grammy. I've seen the Lord. I've heard the Lord call my name. And then, say you have parents in their 90s. They're going to say, Honey, you're not going to know what I believe, what I just saw last night. Visions and dreams. How many have had that happen in your family yet? Yes? yes? Then you've experienced the truth and the power of Pentecost. Now, when we get to the next one, ready for the next one? The, um, uh, on John chapter 7, I just want to show you one more third hour. John 7, who wrote John? John. My mother said, you're a smart girl. Alright, John chapter 7. Now, when you read John, he does something interesting in his studies. He gives us everything around Jewish feasts. So, if you really want to get the, the good meat and potatoes of this, you've got to understand the feasts. Now, if you go with me to um, chapter 7 of John, if you go with me to uh, verse number 10, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is also is happening during the third hour. Okay, you got the third hour? But after this, the brethren had gone up to the feast. What feast is that? Tabernacles. All right, that we say another word back there is Sukkoth. How many ever heard of Sukkoth? 
Now I told you that uh, the Jewish people down in Lakewood are trying to buy the whole town. They're knocking on doors literally and saying, sell us your house. Because they found out it was on a direct parallel to Jerusalem. So they want to own all of Lakewood. Um, but, but there's a Catholic university there too, that should be interesting. I don't know if the Catholics want to sell out a whole university to them. And, and call it Hebrew University 2 or something like that. Amen. So we can see here that he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him in the feast, saying, where is he? Now, if you circle the word, where is he, what does that mean? What is he? It goes back to the man. It goes back to the man, what is it? Okay? And then, and there was much muttering about him. Now, what's the muttering? It's back to the desert. What do they do in the desert? Complain. 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 We're sick of this milky bolognese. Is that all we're going to get? Bakke <laughs> Bene with shrimp in it and everything else. We want something else. Amen? He's a good man, while some said, he, he, no, he's leading people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Now watch, this is really good. The Jews marveled at it, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? You see, when you're in the power of the Spirit, God begins to teach you. And that's why Peter got out there and did what? He stood, he, opened, he got a scripture from God, Joel, and began preaching at the bottom of Mount Zion, the city of the living God. And then he, he starts saying these words to us. And uh, if anyone, uh, my teaching is not mine, but he who sent me. If any man's will is to do his will, he shall not know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Authority is the word exousia. It's the power. He shall know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking of his own authority. When you're teaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, people know your words are not yours. That's what happened at the third hour. That's what happened on Pentecost 101. Can you imagine it? Now what happened on Pentecost right, 101 is the, when you have a human tempest, the water, when you have a storm, the water goes this way. But from God it comes down this way. Are you getting that? When I study what the tongues were, they were very thin. The tongues went on a diet. They were very thin over each person. It was so loud inside that it broke beyond the borders of the wall so the people on the outside heard it too. And so what we need to do for in the power of the third hour, power of the third hour, we need to really, I mean this in all reverence, have a ruckus in here so that they on the outside can know what we're doing in here. In other words, what I mean by that in, in your terms. In your terms, I would say, there's got to be life-changing events going on in here before those on the outside will come in here. Because when you look at, when you leave church on Sunday, you'll back worse than when you first came in. So, and, and, until you, until you get, get a change, then they'll say, what's the change? And how do I get it? Because remember Pentecost? What does this mean and how do I get it? Is anybody asking you like that? When they look at you, they say, I don't want what you got. Amen? I don't want it. So that's the third hour. Now let's start the sixth hour, all right? Moving up the scale. At the third hour, and now we go to the sixth hour. I just want to get you a sense of what's going on in that third hour experience. I'll just give you a, 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 a few small cross-references. Now we're going into the sixth hour, and I want to give you nine experiences of the sixth hour. You ready for this? And if you understand, Holy Spirit, help me. If you understand this hour of, of the Holy Spirit, when you understand this hour, your, your life is going to change. Amen? Turn to the person next to you. You, you need it. You need it. Okay, this is going to lift you up. You'll even, you'll even buy back your tambourine and start dancing all over St. Mark's. Okay? So you're, you're going to see. Father, when you were talking about uh, the whole sense of them looking to me, that the Spirit came the, uh, upon the mountain on the east side of the city. Now, our sanctuary faces east. Does your sanctuary face east? It's a boastful. Yeah. 
right? This one. Does. The altar is supposed to face east. Yeah, when, when uh, originally when the priest faced that way, with his back to us, it was facing east, am I right? Right, it should always face east. It should always face east. So when, when you point that out here, I know it's pointing to Pentecost, but at the same token, it does point to us waiting for Jesus, right? Yes. And then, so yes. the third hour would be encapsulated within that? Yes. Okay, everybody ready for the sixth hour? Yes. All right. Turn to the person next to you. This is really good. Now, when we get into the sixth hour, if you go back with me to John, John 4. Did you know that John is very much in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do I hear? Amen. Amen. Now, everybody go down with me to... Um, and we did a whole Bible study just on this woman. What was her name? What was her name? Fortina, very good. Okay, let me show you where the number six is. Okay? If you go to, put a little star there, and if you go by four six, do you see the six hour there? John. John chapter. Everybody see the six hour? So what time are we up to now? Six hour. What time is that? Noon. No. No. Okay, now. We all know it, as believers in Jesus what happened at noon, right? Yes. Jesus was what? Crucified, right? Now this is the sixth hour. This is the sixth hour of the Holy Spirit. So what happens at the sixth hour? Now I really want to build this up and really give you good stuff. Amen? Amen. All right, everybody say that? Sister Marie. Yes. All right, everybody see the sixth hour there? Yes. Let me read that for us. And verse 6, Jacob's well was there. So all, all of a sudden we have in the presence of, what do we have in the presence of the six hour, just review, marriage. Because you, you, you stood at a bear. You write it in English, B-E-E-R. I don't mean a, a, a Bud Light or a Schlitz or whatever else you used to drink years ago. Okay, how many remember Schlitz and Valentine and everything else, okay? You forgot those kind of years. Uh, now they're all different uh, national ones. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, weird as he was with the journey, he's weary and he sat down. Now, when he sits down, he's ready to do what? Teach him. But this is a weariness. Why does he sit down? Because as he's traveling into Samaria, it's not a welcome spot. When you read about the power of the Holy Spirit going forth, what's the first area he wants back? Acts 1 8. Do you remember? He wants Samaria. He wants Samaria back. Because it was destroyed in 721 BC. So Jesus has to go there. And the year is what? Mm -hmm. Jesus' ministry is somewhere between the year 26 AD to 30. If you want to give yourself a timetable. So he has to visit Samaria because they've been bounced out of his call. And he's bringing them back in the call. So what time is it? Sixth hour. Now what is he telling the Samaritans? I'll die for you. Okay? So they checked their sundials. And it was new. Now, we're looking for a reference for the Holy Spirit. When this, what is the sixth hour? And this is where I want to build up the nine points. I'll give them to you quickly. This is about worship. When you come into the third hour, it's about, okay, now we're refreshed. Okay, what do I do now that i got the third hour and i got the Holy Spirit in me? i got to learn how to worship. Now, most of us don't know how to worship. Amen? Amen? To worship means you look directly at God and you give Him His attributes and you speak directly to Him. You worship Him. Many of us have not left church refreshed because you haven't worshipped Him. Did you worship Him last night? Yes. Okay, are, are, you, are you getting it? Did you, worship, did you worship him in the foyer today in your church? In the church. Okay, oh, you were in the church. Did you worship him today in the church? Okay, so you came in. Now we're going to build into worship. And all of this might shock you when you first hear it with me. Are you, are you with me? Now there came, look at verse 7. Everybody can see the sixth hour? There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now how do you say draw water? Moses, right? Jesus said to her, give me a drink. 
when his disciples had gone away into a city to buy food. Remember, they went to the Jewish delicatessen. <laughs> the Samaritan woman said, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus answered, So right now we're encountering a very unusual encounter. This encounter at the sixth hour is not supposed to happen. When you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, for the most part, you don't think it's going to happen, right? You didn't plan on the Holy Spirit coming. When Jesus shows us the way, Jesus shows us by footprints. When the Holy Spirit comes in, He shocks you. Now remember, He not only shocks you, He gives you it all. Right? Because He's what being what? Poured out. So He's not going to come and say, I'll give you a little dribble now, give me a little dribble, will you? Huh? It's everything. It's, it's a full powering at the sixth hour. So when Jesus dies on the cross at the, at the sixth hour, did he give it all? Did he die a little bit here and a little bit there? How many, how many think the cross covers it all? How many think the cross did it all? Ma'am, are you, are, you, are you fixing this? So when it comes to the Samaritan woman at the sixth hour, he says, honey, this is Father Bill's loose Hebrew Greek translation. Honey, you're going to get it all. You are absolutely going to get it all. How many want it all? Anybody want it all? Or how many? So what happens on your Pentecost? On your Pentecost, you should be getting it all. Amen? Now he says there, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, what is this doing on the sixth hour? It's breaking down every bad relationship. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 20, there was a wall around the, the temple. I told you many times about three foot high. And you were not allowed to go in. But now God is what breaking down everything. So what is this woman recalling? I can't come near you. Now what happened on Pentecost? On Pentecost, women worshipped God with men. The first time ever in human history. Now what happens before uh, Acts chapter 1, 12 to 14? Right now, the woman starts to worship God with Jesus. Wow, you getting the picture? How many would not like to have a worship service with Jesus alone? Okay, are, are you getting this? Now, that should be happening. Are you getting this, ma'am? Yes. Okay, now, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, Jesus answered, now put a big star right there, right there, here comes the Holy Spirit, okay? If you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, now, you, you gotta, we got to break this down. The gift of God. Jesus said after he, he, he died on the cross, and he's, he's going to make us fresh fruits. Gifts given to you are for others. Right? Supernaturally, God's going to give you gifts. Secondly, fruit. Fruits of the Spirit are for me. May I make that fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5. So which is more important? For you to grow as a believer, it's fruit. And basis of all, of course, is love. Agape. Now, Jesus doesn't say, the gifts of the Spirit. He said, did you know the gift of the Spirit? Now, the gift of the Spirit here is the Holy Spirit. This is the gift. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that in all of eternity, the love affair, and what do you think? What do you think in eternity past? Let's go to eternity past. There was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Now, did they have to speak human words? Did they speak English? No, they probably spoke Italian. And the Father looked at Jesus. And the Holy Spirit was just there between them. And he went, no. <laughs> or definitely Tagalog came through that. No, he didn't speak any of that. You know when Tagalog was made, sir? Genesis 11. When the Tower of Babel started, can you imagine the, a few Tagalogites were up there? And, uh, sama, sama, tayo, ma. They said, what the heck are you saying? And they said, speak English, you know? So, what did the Father and the Son do for all eternity? They just looked at each other. 
And the Holy Spirit was going back and forth. Are you getting this? I mean, how long can you do that? <laughs> Jesus had to go away to his cave. Remember the cave you saw? Right. right at the bottom of the Sermon on the Mount? And Brother Peter didn't get his 5,000 pictures of it. Right at the bottom there. That's where he just stared. That's where he stared and he got the confirmation of his life. So now this is called the gift. Now watch this. The gift is called the Holy Spirit. Hour 6. What did Jesus do on the cross? He had to open his body to give out the Holy Spirit. Long Jonas was just checking to see if he was alive, but he went, he stuck it out, out came blood and water. So blood and water was the current, is the current of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, are you getting this? So this is called the gift. Now, the Holy Spirit is the gift. It's directly tied into salvation. It's directly tied into salvation. When you have the Holy Spirit, you know there is a Holy Spirit, Virginia. You know there's a real Holy Spirit. How many know there's a real Holy Spirit? Didn't it take you a long time to discover there's a real Holy Spirit? And many days in my journey, I go along and say, where did that come from? Or how come I'm doing this? Or how come I'm doing that? Um, amazing things begin to happen. Now what happens here is this. When the Spirit comes, He comes to say, He's going to be released upon everybody at the twelfth, uh, at the sixth, sixth, uh, at the sixth hour. He's going to be released upon everybody. Two things have got to happen to you at the twelfth hour. The two things that are going to happen to us at the twelfth hour, you've got to get Spirit in you, which means you can't live in your own power anymore, and you seek nothing but the truth. So you get spirit and truth. Okay? Now spirit is the power of God in you. So here comes now the gift. And this is what we get when we know we're on the way of, of the Savior. We get spirit and truth. Now we're going to break that down some more for us. We get spirit and truth when you're at the sixth hour. Are you get, everybody getting this? Now watch this because we're going to really start to explode. Amen? Amen. Now... People were, people were coming to him, and what happens there, if you underline there, give me a drink. If you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink. Now, the Holy Spirit is always connected to water. <clears throat> so here Jesus makes a clear reference to the water. So out of him came blood and water, but it was mixed together. The water had to come out. So Jesus emptied all five liters of his blood and out came tons of water. Whoa, are you getting this? It says that his bleeding burst open and all the water, there was, there was a river. And I told you many times, the miracle of that is dead men don't bleed. He was already dead and out came the river. And Mel Gibson's film, they, they, I like the sense of being sprayed upon their faces. And you can even see Mary in that Mary had some of the droppings of the blood. Are, are you getting this with me? Now, what happens here, when you're in the Spirit, let me show you something. This is really, really good. Amen? Amen. Now, when you come into this hour, there is a restoring of the tabernacle of David. Did you know that? What's the tabernacle? What did David do when the ark began coming in in 2 Samuel 5 and 6? He began to dance before the ark, remember? And he, he had a marital problem right away. I don't think he was going to see 40 years with that woman. Forget about it. And she says, look at that bloody fool out there. Imagine Elizabeth looking at you and Michael and saying, what is he doing out there now? And she does say that. She just watched Michael. Michael dances around all the time in the house and she can't figure her husband out. And she figured, I'm stuck with him now. All right, now, what happens is that we're going to see... Put a spot with me there, and we're really going to break this down for you. Um, go with me. Hold your spot. We're in the we're in the we're in the sixth hour. Go to chapter fifteen of Acts. Acts the fifteenth chapter. Now, this this is the time when we're going to start to drink. What are we going to do during this time? We're going to start to get into worship. Would you like to really worship? Yes. How many of us sitting in a church 
and repeating the prayers back and forth does not necessarily mean that you worship, right? Do you ever do that? Yes. And what do people say? Got nothing out of it. Back and forth, back and forth. That's it. Do you think you really came into worship? Now, in chapter 15, verse 16, chapter 15, verse 16, this, by the way, put a little big note by right there. This is, um, this is a magnificent verse. Let, let's, let's see what happened by verse 16. After this, I will return. Shub. I'll return. And I will reveal the dwelling of David. What's the sixth hour? Destroy, destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it. Do you remember that? John chapter 2, destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it, right? So what is the sixth hour? The temple is going to start to be built. What did I just say to you a few moments ago? They're working on the third temple right now. Right now, as I speak. Okay, now, I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. The temple of David, which is for, uh, the temple of the dwelling of David, the dwelling. And, and what does Jesus say to us in John 1 14? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the word for dwelling. I will bring it to back right now and I will rebuild its ruins. Everything that was destroyed, when you look at the sixth hour, what do you see? Everything is really bad. Good Friday didn't look too pretty, did it? Our Lord Jesus was destroyed, wasn't he? He said, I will be consumed for you. What's the sixth hour? When you be consumed. When you're utterly consumed. For, for Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit. So what do we got to be in the Spirit? Consumed. And I will set it up. So who's going to set it up? God's going to do that. That the rest of men may seek the Lord. So who's going to set up the new temple? God's going to set up the new temple. What's the new temple, everybody? Jesus. The new temple is going to be set up. Now, when it's set up, that all, look at verse 17. All the Gentiles are called by my name. So now we get the Gentiles coming in, that's us. Says the Lord who made these things known from of old. Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Let them turn to God. Now, what's going to happen is an unbelievable thing happens here. We have in verses, um, we have in verse, uh, I'm trying to see the exact verses. We have in the very next section a letter that's sent out. See where it says letter in the next section? For your information, here's a shock. Ready? Here's a good shock. That's the first penny of the New Testament ever. This is the first time that the New Testament started to be written down. And here's more, another shock. What were the first words? What were the first words of the New Testament that were written down for us? If you go all the way down to, um, go down to verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and what is estranged, and from unchastity cornea. And if you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. Farewell. That's the first time they sent a letter out. And that's the first time we have scripture in the New Testament. How many say, wow? wow. Now, what does it mean, Sister Murray? She just said, wow, we're here. That's a delayed reaction. Do you see the Holy Spirit in there? Yes. So what are they introducing to each other? The Holy Spirit. Here's what the Holy... Now, how did they say that? Here's what the Holy Spirit told us to do. Okay, so now what's the church starting to do? Call upon the Holy Spirit. How many would like to have a church where we said, the Holy Spirit says to do this? Okay, are you getting this? Now, let's build into your personal worship. Ready? I'm going to give you what they did in the Bible. 
Um, what they did in the Bible, uh, uh, what happened in this hour, okay? To really, res there's nine experiences, nine experiences of the Holy Spirit that you test Spirit and truth. Ready for this? All right, I'm going to give you nine things. You ready to go? Go slow. Say go slow. Go slow. Okay, very good. Now, if you're going to have this, this, this real experience at this hour, we're going to see a restoration. Everything that's been knocked down, it's going to be built up. Everything's going to be... And what happens to you and me when we're knocked down? You're going to be built up. You're going to get a brand new body one day. Ready? Okay, here we go. So, um, we're going to come into spirit and in truth. Do I hear amen? Amen. Okay, do you need spirit and truth? Yes. Now, there should be a burning in each of us if the Holy Spirit's upon each person here, you want the truth. Amen. You can't get enough of it. Now, when you're in the Holy Spirit, amazing things begin to happen to that woman with Jesus. Remember, Jesus led her into a full worship service. Worship the Spirit in truth. Is it here in Jerusalem? Or is it in another mount called the Mount Gerizim? Now, what was that Mount, mount Gerizim? It was a mountain in, in John 4, which is, goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It was the spot where the chosen people of Israel met right in the center between blessings and curses. curses. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 26 and 27. 27 and 28. You're either blessed or you're cursed. Now, when Moses was looking at all the people are right in the center of these valleys. On one side was Ebal, E-B-A-L. The other was Gerizim. Right close to the Samaritan woman, she's looking out and saying, what should we worship on Mount Gerizim to get the blessings of God? And Jesus says, it's not here, or it's not in Jerusalem. Why is it in Jerusalem? Because there's got to be a new Jerusalem. Because what did, what, did, what did the Jews do to Jerusalem? They made it a religious hodgepodge of mess. How many know we made our own religion a mess right now? Yes? yes. Where we lack reverence and holiness and all those things. Now, what happens if you go through the scripture, how to worship, and the first thing you got to do, and I'm going to give you nine experiences of really coming into full worship, and that's telling God how much He is worth. You got that? All right, the first thing is, when you come in, into this kind of worship, when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman at what hour? Six, six hours. hours. The six hour. We're, we're going to give you nine quick things. I'm going to go through quickly. The first thing is, you got to sing. Sing. Hallelujah. Sing. Okay, there has to be song. No, sing. <laughs> okay, now, sing is a sign that you've been redeemed. Even if it's in Italian, you sing. Okay? So that's number one. If you're going to come into worship, what Jesus had... So what was that Samaritan woman doing at the 12th hour? She was singing. Second thing is this. When you look at the whole book, when you look at the, the scriptures, you begin to shout your praises. She shouted, the whole church almost passed out. Amen. Right? <laughs> Three ladies passed out with their rosaries, they almost passed right out there. Right? So what do you what do you do? You shout unto the Lord. Shout to the Lord. What does it mean? It means beautifully proclaimed. What happened on Pentecost? Do you think there's Peter got up and said, Brethren, brethren of all Jerusalem, do you know about the great things that happen right now? Brethren, do you know what just happened? And the Lord just put in his throat a megaphone, 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 megaphone. And there was Francine with St. Peter doing a tambourine act, okay? Okay, you get this? So there's got to be a shouting. Now, you might have grown up saying, no, that's irreverent. But this is a holy shout. 
Now shout unto the Lord. Let me give you examples of people who shout it. How many ever heard of Gideon? The word it means the, uh, the uh, champion. So when he came down that mountain and God put a supernatural dream in all the enemies, the Midianites, what happened is they saw all piece of bread rolling down the hill. And how many of they got scared just seeing bread roll down? I would, I would get up and eat it. But they just saw this bread rolling down the hill. And God gave them all the same dream. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, now, what did he do when he ran down? He shouted for the Lord and for Gideon. Do you understand the context I mean shouting? What happened with, in Jericho, with the Ark of the Covenant? Was they shouted unto the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, God, God is not concerned with volume. God's concerned with your whole inner man and your whole inner woman proclaiming this. And what happens to you if you proclaim it? You begin to worship. Yes. Are you getting this, Mother Francie? Father Bill, could you say that this, the seeing of the bread could be a type of the Eucharist? Yes. Which was the Lord. Yes, the which they could receive. And they they just, could. <laughs> they just, are, are you seeing this? Yes. Okay, yes. so now, what are you going to do? If, what, what, is, what does the woman do? She went out and tell her other fellow Samaritan, she shouted out, you know what, everybody? I just found someone who told me about all my mortal sins. <laughs> Let me tell you about my mortal sins, baby. I've been with man number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight. I've been man with number one, number two, number three, number four, number three. Can, can you just see? His name was John, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> I think we should have a feast uh, next Sunday. Everybody get up. Let me hear about your mortal sins, baby. Let me hear about them. Amen. You did what? At your age? Wee! I am 17, going on 16. Wee! Amen. So how many here can shout it out? Amen. Amen. I told you, and said it's not as I had the wailing women coming in. You want to do what? Reverend? I said, yes, sugar. We just want to pray. I said, well, I think you should pray. And they were walking back. Oh, no! They were shouting. <laughs> then when I was eating my meatballs and spaghettis, the meatball bounced off the table and onto the floor. <laughs> Larry, there's a person not behaving back there right now. The third day. What did Jesus do at the sixth hour? He continuously spoke. Did you know that? When you read the Greek, when you read the Greek, it says continuously. When Jesus is on the cross, do you know those words, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do? It's in the progressive sense when you read the Greek. That means he kept saying it. He kept saying it. He kept saying it. He, kept, he had three hours, right? So what's the sixth hour say? So what did she hear? I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. And she spoke her forgiveness. Is that good? Yes. So how many here think you can worship like this? Sing. Shout. And speak. Everybody follow me so far? So far so good. Now, put a big star by verse number number three. The speaking. The speaking is called your praise to God. Your praise to God. I like going to do my holy hours. And um, sometimes I make sure the door is locked so nobody can sneak in. Because I'm talking to God. Lord, we got to talk right now, Lord. I mean, I just, I, I, you know, I'm just looking around here in Ridgefield. Things aren't going away. They should go. Come on, Lord, let's do it right now. You know? So I want to make sure nobody's in the church. I lock all the doors. All right. So what did this le woman learn from Jesus at the six hours? The fourth, uh, the, the the next thing, the fourth thing is she knew how to use her hands when you worship. You've got to use your, your body parts. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3, how did the early believers pray? What happened on that Pentecost? Now, here's what the Holy Spirit showed me. 
what happened initially when the Holy Spirit came and there was COVID, they were like, the first initiation was what Isaiah experienced in chapter 6 of Isaiah. Isaiah says, as you recall, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he saw the angel coming with the tongues and touching his lips. So the first moment you see this, you're paralyzed. You're paralyzed. But so much so that it had to travel on the outside and then guess what happened? You begin to lift up your hands. What did Jesus do at the sixth hour? Does everybody know for three straight hours, Jesus had a three straight hour holy hour? So when Jesus is encountering this woman, it's an incredible holy hour, isn't it? Now this is how that fallen hut of David is going to be what? Restored. Now the next thing is, what happens is, you start to lift up the holy. So when she gave him the water, she was using her hands. Yes. Wow. You got it. Wow. You could just see her with the holy bucket. Yes. The number five. When you come to worship, when you come to worship, you come to even use a sense of joy in you. What's your sense of joy? You start to clap. In the book of Numbers, they were saying, lift up a well. What did David do before the ark? Number six, what else did they do when they came into the worship of the living God? They knew how to lift up. What do we sing in many of our songs? Oh Lord, we lift up your name. Now what does it mean to lift up? To lift up means to let it be so known. Remember, this is how they prayed in the first century. This is how our blessed Lord died on the cross. They did not pray like this. There's no reference to folded hands. Next, they, they knew how to have the... Um, they, they knew how to... Uh, number seven. They knew how to bow down. They knew how to bow. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, I bow my knees to the Father. So, how, how many have ever knelt down before? When I read the book Mother Francine gave me, Mary is always bowing down to Jesus. <laughs> always bowing down. Next, number eight, they knew how to stand. What is the sign of standing? It's the resurrection. They knew how to stand. Now, every time you stand, you you're in front of your, your what? You're in front of the judge of all things. Standing and bowing down before him. And then finally, what they had knew how to do was they knew how to dance before the Lord. One thing Jewish people do is dance. Strange thing, men with men, right? Don't think it's strange. That's, the, that's their custom, right? This is the 12th hour, Father? This is, no, we're only on the 6th. No, I know, but you're saying it's such fullness. I'm saying it's... No, this is the 6th hour. This is only 6th. This is only 6th. When you build up in the Holy Spirit, because we just did John, it's the 6th hour. Mother Francine? Uh, I have a question. I, I hear you refer to the 6th hour when they crucified him, and all the, the gospel readers, the writers say, like Princess Mark says, and they crucified him... Um, it was the third hour when they crucified him. Right. But he died on the sixth. No. no. May I explain that? No. There seems that? to be confusion. May I, I explain that? Okay. How many hours was he on the cross? Three. Six. Three. Three. Was he on the sixth? Is he crucified on the No, no, no. Uh, it, it's, may I explain that? I'll explain it. Please. No, it's fine. Okay. When you look at Jewish time, they are, there are intervals of how many hours? Three. 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 How many hours, man? Four hours. Is that, is that there's, there's 10, 11, 12, three hours. See, three oh. hours. Now, when you have, when you have that time, it's allotted anywhere in that time. Right. So if, you, if it says there, it, Mark, what, what is Mark saying there? Mark is saying they crucified him in the third hour because when the time is ready to change the 12th hour, it's included in the third hour. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The third hour, you've got to take the whole segment together. The third hour is three hours. 
Oh. It's a, so in that segment right. is uh, 1159. Mm -hmm. So Mark says it's the 12th hour. It's the, it's the third hour. So 12 one, one, by 12 o'clock is the time he was crucified. So that, that's the, when, you, when you study the, the intervals. That's uh, because I, I, asked, I asked, asked your question years ago. I always thought it, it, it made perfect sense for him to be crucified on the, the third hour, meaning nine o'clock, because that's when the lambs were slaughtered and killed, and three o'clock were slaughtered right. and killed. Right. So that made sense to me. Our best, our best, our best understanding was he's only on the cross for three hours. And so they took that integral there, and they went to 1159, and that's when things... So this is an opinion of the scholars? This is what the scholars are saying. This is what the oh, so then so, they could be Because wrong. if... Right. No, no, here's where, here's where the confusion lay. <coughs> if Jesus died at 9 o'clock, or was crucified at 9, we'd have a problem. You would have to say the Bible contradicts itself. Why? Because you can't be crucified at the 9th, and others say the 12th, uh, at 12 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. He can't be yeah. crucified both at both those times. So you would have to, it, it, you have to say, there's a contradiction here. So when we really study, when we, when we, for example, too, um, in the Gospel of Luke, it says Quirinius was governor when you read the um, incarnation account. If you go to Luke chapter 2, it says Quirinius was governor of Syria. That's in 6 AD. So, I mean, Jesus was born way before that, so, hello, somebody's wrong. How could they put Quirinius in there? So, the enemies of Scripture say, your Bible contradicts itself. So, was Luke saying it contradicted? No. Within that time slot, we remember somebody famous called Quirinius, who was the leader of... So, here it is, but Jesus is already born over here in this time slot. And Quirinius is over here. So we want to locate when Jesus was born during the time of Quirinius. But Quirinius was already on this side and Jesus was born on this side. So, so the same thing with the hours. Go ahead. So it's four time slots of three hours. That's right. right. So what, 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 what happens to Mark is he looks at it and he says, probably around the third hour, but it was just ready to change. That would be the time slot. That would, that would be the Plus time slot. they had a watch on this. They didn't, they didn't so check their right. sundials. That's why they probably... <laughs> okay? Thank you. The, the, you're, 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 that's great. Now, so what happens at this hour? It's the hour of standing up. There for the number nine. You ready for number nine? Number nine. Number nine, it stands. Now, when you, so what did this woman do? Well, she went there and telling everybody. So what happened at this hour? That's how to worship God. Wow. Want to try? We did yes. that. Yes. Sing, shout, speak, did dance, that clap, night. lift up, uh, bow, stand, stand. Do you know anybody, ma'am, that does that? Yes. How many know this is normal? And put a little note in there for you. This is a taste of heaven. Amen? Because you are meant to use your whole being in worship. But guess what you have been taught? Quiet. Be quiet down there. Amen? Now, here we have, um, it's trying, it's very, this is getting, put a little note in there. Wow. When all of this happens, number one, it's getting the people to praise. This is bringing you into the praise of God. Number two, when you do this, you break down every wall in front of you. There's not one wall that can stand. If, by the way, if you want to try it at home, lock your doors. Make sure Rita's out and went to the meeting. Okay? That's, uh, just tr try this. You break down every single barrier. Amen? Amen? So, now, did that woman get ready to do Evangelization 101? Whoa. Whoa. Now, if God gets anything from us, what is the 12th, what is this six hours say? I want worship. What God wants for himself is worship. Now, every time you have this worship going on, this is called, ready? The noise around the tabernacle. This is called the noise around the tabernacle. Let me show you a passage. Are you getting this? Sister Maria, are you getting this? You experienced that last night. 
Now, if you look at Job chapter 36. Job chapter 36. Job chapter 36. Now, when you worship like this, this is called. No, you want When you worship like this, this is called. Ready? What the scripture says? When you worship like this, this is called the spreading of the rain. When you worship like this, this is called the spreading of the rain. Okay? Everybody say, wow. Wow. All right, everybody in chapter 36 of Job? Yeah. Now, what does Job mean? Hostility. Now, watch this. This is really getting deep. Number 36, he covered... Number 36. Did I lose 36 already? No, you should have 36. No, 36, 27. 36, 27. 36, 27. 36, 27. 36, 27. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. He draws up the drops of water. Now, what is God doing? What does it have here? God's drawing it up. So what is God drawing up to, with the woman? Her what? Her praise and what? Adoration. Now, how many ever did adoration? Did you ever do adoration, ma'am? Sir, did you ever do adoration? When you did adoration, what is God doing? Soaking it up. What are you doing when you're doing adoration? Here you go. This is what you're doing. And God is soaking it up. Amen? Amen. Now, put a little note there when you do adoration. Read that verse. Let's go on with that verse. He distills the mist in the rain, which the skies pour down and drop upon man abundantly. Now, when you worship God, how many ever worship God? When you worship God, what happens is your praise goes up to Him, and then He turns around and drops an abundance of graces and mercy upon you. Wow, how many think you would like to do that? Yes. This is the sixth hour. And then it goes on with me, Sister Marie. Now look at the look at the word there. The skies. See the word poor again? See the word poor? Pour down and drop upon man abundantly. Now what did Jesus say to us in John 10:10? 10, 10? I've come to bring life, life abundantly. What does abundance mean? Abundance means I will give you everything you need, even with more left over, so that more left over so that you can share with everybody around you. In, the, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 46, 44, 45, 46, 47, and 48, Jesus says that it rains on the just and on the unjust. And the reason why the unjust are receiving good things at the second, some of them, is because you're living the faith now. Wow. And so what's happening in our worship before God, God is absorbing it, and it comes back to us poured out. And when it's poured out, there is an abundance. Now, this is called praise that costs the most that God can give us. This is praise. All of this destroys all the darkness inside of you. If you learn to do this, you will not have darkness in you. That woman had, boy, one, two, three, four, five, six, remember? She went to Hollywood. She says, I've been rich and I've been poor, and I like rich a whole lot more. <laughs> okay, remember? She, this girl's been around the block, and then some. 
And what happened when she met the Lord Jesus? She said, you're the Savior of the world. And then when the people came, the Samaritans came in to see Jesus, what did they say? We know what she said is true. And now, what is the greatest miracle? I want to give you a new insight to Pentecost. What is the greatest miracle of Pentecost for you personally? And I've been sharing with you last week, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, Acts 2.21. But can I give you something for you personally? The greatest act for you personally is to be able to describe your inner being with clarity to the world. That's the greatest miracle of Pentecost for you. Okay? Amen? Push the button. Now, I want to share with you the greatest part of Pentecost for you. It's when you are able to share your own insight and incredible clarity to the entire world. How many think that will be a miracle of Pentecost? That's what Pentecost should mean for us. And Mary said it this way, look what God has done for me. Do you remember that? Amen? Amen. Wow. Sister Marie. I experienced that last night. Now, what happens this. Now, still look with me. Let me show you something really good. This is really good. Turn to the person and say, this is going to blow your mind. Now, look at verse 26 and 27. And anybody here, what, what's just happened now? What just happened is this is exactly how clouds are made. Yeah. Right. Clouds. Clouds are made. This is how clouds are made. What leads us to our promised land living? The clouds. You see Jesus goes up and he's coming back. So what's Jesus coming back on? The prayers. Now, can I invite you to do something, even with a tambourine, ma'am? you got to sing. Because I hope, Lord willing, when you and I go to heaven, because Jesus sits on the praise of his faithful people, I hope you sing in Creole and French and bonjour, and Tagalog, and Italian. I hope you see your praise in heaven. I hope you don't walk around, where's my voice? Pentecost means the taking of all the voices and going up. When all the voices go up, your voice and mine, it forms a cloud. The cloud leads us into promised land living the theophony, T-H-E-O, theo, God, funny, P-H-A-N-Y, which means the manifestation of God, so theophany is the, the power of God. What is the Holy Spirit to you and to me? The Holy Spirit, ready? Is continuous manifestations of God in my life. Amen. Now, I'm going to call you up every day, all of you, and you're going to say to you, what did God do for you today? If you say nothing, I'm hanging up. <laughs> and I will never call you again. Amen. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. How you doing? I'm hanging in there. Oh, you are boring. Goodbye to you. All right? God, save me from boring, dull, distilled people. Now, what happened is that when, when you have the Holy Spirit, there are always, always, what does always mean in Greek? Always. always. Manifestations of the power of God. Always. Even when you drive that little car, Brother Michael, and your kids want it. I mean, everything, every, there's always manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And it should have you in awe of what God is doing. Are you getting this? Yes. So I want you to box in there those little verses of Job. This is how we form the praise of God. Now watch this, you get more good stuff. Now, from this comes the liquid, the water. Remember Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, this is the water. Now... Your praise of God is your vapors going up. I have a new thing that, how many have ever been in pain before? Nobody. Okay, one minute. You know, every time I walk around saying, thinking of my pain, I go, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. In other words, I start to praise Jesus. Amen. And I'm sending up my praise before the Lord. Amen. Because I want manifestation 
heal this body, Lord. If it's going to last another two decades, I don't know how it's going to last one, let alone two. <laughs> now, nothing, nothing, not absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. Now, the nothing goes up that doesn't come down. When you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, when you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you send it up, it comes back down. Amen? Amen. You've heard that expression one million times, you can't outgive the Lord. I, good stuff. You got the cloud stuff. Okay, now, that's the cloud that led the people of Israel out. Now, I just want to introduce us to the ninth hour. Are you ready for the ninth hour? Good stuff? All right, I just want to show you where it is, that's all. All right, any thoughts, my dear? You're very good tonight. You know, my mother told you. Okay, now, I just want to show you where the ninth hour is, and we'll pick up there, Lord willing, next time. Good stuff? Now, we're going to the ninth hour. Go with me now. Let's get the hours. What's the first hour? Pentecost. The, the third hour? What's the sixth hour? Well, we see the Samaritan, and that's when Jesus died, right? What is the uh, ninth hour? Oh, I'll show you right now. Go to Acts. Who wrote Acts? St. Luke, very good. And what did he say uh, at, the, the, at this time? Get your acts together. Okay, I just want to introduce this to you, that's all, and we're done. To, to, now, this is really, this is, this is incredible. Amen? Now, this is so incredible what should be happening to you at the ninth hour. We. Acts 3. Okay, good stuff. Let's see, so you're getting good stuff. It's great. Uh, are, are you thinking about this now? Yeah, Sister Marie, yeah. are you ready to march around the church? Yes. Yeah. All right, Sister Marie is going to march around the church. Okay, now, I just want to show you in the Bible where it says the ninth hour. What's the ninth hour, everybody? Three o'clock. Now, you've all heard Divine Mercy at three o'clock, right? What else is supposed to happen at the o'clock that nobody ever told you? How many ever prayed at Divine Mercy at three? How many ever got woken up at three? How many never fall asleep until three and four and five and six? Okay. Welcome to my life. Okay. How many get called from Sri Lanka at three? Resurrection. Okay. Now three o'clock. Now watch this. You see it in there? Verse one. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Verse 1. Acts 3, 1. Everybody see it there? Now, how many ever prayed at a 3 o'clock hour ever in your life? And we're going to make a day where we're all going up to the shrine to pray up there. And at 3 o'clock, hopefully, we'll be in the National Shrine praying our Divine Mercy at 3 o'clock. Now, what's supposed to happen at 3 o'clock? Mercy. Dun, dun, dun. No, not only that. Jesus. Not only that. Do you know the story of Acts 3? Dun, dun. Acts 3, my dear. You're supposed to be healed at the, at the, at the ninth hour. So what's the ninth hour? Healing. Wow. So how many ever said you're doing a divine mercy? What are you saying? Healing, baby. Wow. Healing. Stay tuned next week when we get into the ninth hour and then we start heading into the eleventh hour, which is absolutely mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. What does the eleventh hour mean, which we're in right now? Good stuff? Part three, next week, we're getting into the ninth hour, then we'll get into the eleventh hour, and then we'll really start to take off. Amen? Amen. Amen. And this is going to affect generation after generation. Anybody got kids? We're going into your kids next week. Amen? Amen. Okay, this, this is really good. You got kids, ma'am? Do you have kids, ma'am? Are they very interesting? Do they cause you to pray a whole lot more? Okay. Okay, your Peter and your Maria cause you to pray. 
Uh, Peter calls us here to pray. Amen. Hey, what's up, ma'am? All right, we're, we're, uh, this, this microphone died on me. Of course. You don't give me proper stuff to do my job here. I don't know if it's going to die. All right, Sister Marie, what happened? I just want to share this. For those of you, for those of you who went to the Mass last night, there are a few of us who were there. You know, what Father, what, what Father Bill just put on the board is exactly what we did at that Mass last night. And I, I literally had a physical experience. You know, like when you're praising and speaking and clapping and whatever. And then we're singing, you know, let the fire fall, and you would pray and you'd go down. I literally felt the Holy Spirit all over me every time I bent down. Every time. It was chills, all, like I got it right now. All and, no down. Tambourine, and then today, we did the same thing with the Blessed Mother, and here I was crying. I couldn't stop crying because that, that concert was so magnificent. Each song about the Blessed Mother, and we were singing to her, talking to her, and, and, and doing the same thing, and the same thing happened. So here was, and I was saying today, here Blessed Mother is with us at Pentecost. Amen. Amen. You know, it was a phenomenal if, if experience. If you and I do this Pentecostal experience, it was beyond belief. no darkness will be in you. No, no. No you darkness. Know, and you know, when I just felt like, you know, you felt like you, you were being called, yeah. you know, and you can't shut up anymore. <laughs> you can't shut but up stop. anymore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for the... We thank you for the third uh, hour. We thank you for the sixth hour as we move toward the ninth hour of the Holy Spirit. Prep us, Lord, for really worshiping you and living in the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Kindle with us. Send forth your spirits and they shall be created. And thou shalt be the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This was total confirmation of what goes up comes down. And it's here tonight. All right? Amen. What a Pentecost. Yay. Glory to God. All right. Another woman wants to tell us something. This is just by way of a little testimony. After I left Mass today, I was coming out with a family, and there was two young girls. And the one who was the older girl, she might be around 13, she said to me, gee, I wonder what it's like to speak in tongues. So I said, well, do you want to give? She said, yeah. I said, let's pray right in the parking lot. Laid hands on her, asked the Lord to baptize her. I started praying in tongues. I said, don't speak in English. Whatever comes out of your mouth, speak those words. Me, she went into it like she was doing tongues for years. <laughs> she was so excited. She couldn't wait to go on. So we had Pentecost. Yes. 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 Yes.